All right, it's about that time. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us again on this Tuesday of our COVID lecture series. Uh, we've, we're about halfway through a little bit more through these series, so they've been going really well. Uh, and I just wanna thank everyone for taking their time uh, on their lunch break or in the middle of the day to, to join us and really make these uh, successful. Uh, this week, we have uh, Dr. David Deulius, who's the acting chair of the uh, communications department at Bethany College, and he's going to be doing his lecture today, uh, really talking about uh, the media and just kind of how everything's perceived and, and beyond that. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Deulius, for joining us today, and I'll let you go ahead and get started. Thanks, Ron. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. All right. All right. Um, so as Ron said, I want to um, talk today about how the media reports on COVID-19 and how it um, affects our perceptions and understandings of, of the issue. Um, and as you know, it's a difficult historical moment for the media, for newspapers in particular. Um, they're struggling to keep up with the 24-hour news cycle without compromising their uh, commitment to the credo of objectivity um, that they're losing advertising dollars, that they're losing readership, especially among young people, um, that, that uh, CNN, the Washington Post, uh, the New York Times are uh, spending a lot of money to fight lawsuits um, that pose an existential threat to uh, the, the, the entire industry of journalism. Um, uh, that any, if any of you were watching the Senate confirmation hearings that um, Amy Coney Barrett, the uh, nominee, was very careful uh, in citing um, uh, court precedent um, and, and not giving uh, any thumbs up or thumbs down to any issue. Was very careful not to reveal her personal feelings about any of the issues, uh, but she was unshy about um, expressing her opinion that the media is doing a disservice to the people by with misleading headlines and um, un irresponsible reporting. Um, so, from all sides, from all from both sides of, of the political aisle, the media is under siege. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is talk about uh, two foundational theories in communication studies and media effects uh, research framing theory and agenda setting theory. And I'm gonna talk about why they're so important for uh, the media in this historical moment. Um, that uh, on the first day of journalism school, uh, students are told that you're, you're supposed to be objective, you're supposed to be fair, you're supposed to be balanced, you're supposed to be unbiased and accurate um, down the middle. Uh, but that assumes that there's a truth to, to uncover that uh, journalists can go out and uncover the truth and report it fairly and objectively. But with COVID, there is no truth. That um, reporters, journalists are having to run parallel with with scientists trying to figure out what exactly is happening, um, how and under what conditions the virus is spread. Um, so the, the, there is no objective truth to be uncovered. That we're all trying to to uh, figure out the the what's happening together. So it puts the media in the spotlight because no matter what they do. Um, they are blamed because there's no truth to uncover, that they're not really abiding by their credo of objectivity when objectivity doesn't apply to a situation in the absence of truth. Um, so the, the media is, is, um, is facing an existential threat. Um, so to respond to an existential threat, we have to go back to the theory, the foundations, which are agenda setting theory um, and framing, that these are taught on the first day of communication theory classes, um, I, I'm, they're, they seem like common sense now, um, but they're the foundations of, of the effect of the media on our perceptions, um, on our opinions, on our worldviews. So the first one is a, a agenda setting theory. Um, and I'll give a little bit of background first and then we'll apply it to COVID. So uh, basically the theory uh, was posed in, in, in the 70s. Um, and it says that there's a strong correlation between what the media covers uh, and the issues that we consider to be important. So it literally, the media sets the agenda, um, establishes our mental cue of what is important. 
Um, so what they did, and, and we'll talk about it later, but in, in the 1968 uh, presidential election, they surveyed the electorate in North Carolina and they found a direct correlation uh, between the issues that people listed as important and the issues that were covered in the media. Now, this could be, uh, if, if with newspapers, it could be column inches or page preference if, or um, like it, if, if they put uh, a large headline on the front page, um, that they're implying that that issue, that that, um, that that situation is is more important than others that are buried in the back of the newspaper. Um, so in that way, the newspaper sets the agenda by telling you that one issue is more important than another. Uh, and when you go to vote, when you go to express your opinions at the Thanksgiving dinner table, that those um, issues that are covered more by the media are the ones that you have a stronger uh, opinion about. Um, and it's the same logic as uh, like point of sale advertising, where if you walk into a grocery store, um, not knowing what you want, you know you're thirsty, but you don't have a preference any, in, in any direction. And you see a, at the point of sale an advertisement for Coke, Coke immediately jumps to the, to the front of your mental queue. Um, and you're much more likely to buy a Coke. So it's the same idea with agenda setting theory that um, the more you see an issue in the, in the media, the more you believe it's important. Um, so it's obviously impactful on our perceptions if media have ideological biases and they're only uh, reporting one issue or emphasizing one aspect of one issue over another that we come to uh, believe that one thing is true and one thing is not. So in the absence of an objective truth, the media is literally creating our reality, uh, that they're giving us the coordinates with which to understand the world. Um, so that's agenda setting theory, and we'll return to it a little bit later. But first, I want to introduce framing theory too. Uh, the framing theory is a is an offshoot. It's a cousin. Um, it is the the offspring of agenda setting theory. And there are lots of esoteric debates in the field in the literature about whether framing theory is is a separate thing or whether it is a se a second level of agenda setting theory. Um, but basically framing theory says that the media does not only tell you what to think about, it doesn't only set your mental cue, uh, but it tells you how to think, um, that it gives you the coordinates with which to understand the issue, that the way the issue is presented, uh, the words they choose, the pictures they choose, the lighting in the picture that they choose, uh, the positioning of the pictures and, and the words and the amount of words and all of that stuff, uh, frames, puts a frame around, reifies, helps us to understand the issue uh, rather than just telling us what to think about. So literally it, it, uh, the, the media is um, formative um, in our perceptions and our opinions and our, and our beliefs about the world because the, we rely, especially in a situation with, with COVID, uh, we rely on the media for information. Um, so if, if the way the media frames, just the, the same way that we would frame a picture and define the boundaries of that picture, separate it from the rest of the world, um, the media does the same thing for us. And the way they do it will affect the way we understand an issue. For instance, if there is a, a, a media report about crime in a neighborhood uh, and they report the crime with the words that it's a beast preying on the community, versus a virus infecting the community. A beast preying is very active and threatening and intimidating, whereas a virus is unseen and, and, and implicit. Uh, so if, if the media report on crime in a community with the words beast preying, people are much more likely to be in favor of punitive action, of, of sending people to jail, of higher fines, of, um, of, of um, punitive proactive penalties uh, whereas if they use virus infecting, which is a more passive, implicit uh, way of phrasing uh, the, the, the threat of crime, people are going to be in favor of educational programs or after school programs or uh, counseling or increased funding to uh, youth sports, stuff like that, things that are passive and indirect um, in their treatment of crime. So the way that the media present the issue will affect the way that we understand it and will, will affect um, the, the policies that we, that we support. Um, and obviously the, the framing theory has a long, as does agenda setting theory, has a long history in psychology and, and linguistics and sociology. 
uh, with the work of Goffman on framing in the 70s, uh, the famous work of Kahneman in economics. Um, but it apply, it takes that, that, the, that foundation and applies it to the media. And there are countless, um, uh, a, a very voluminous literature on framing theory and the effects of, of the media on the way that we understand the world. So agenda setting theory, we'll start with. So very simply, the media doesn't tell us what to think, but what to think about. So uh, agenda setting theory doesn't go as far as framing theory. That it, it says that the things that we see around us, the headlines, the amount of time that uh, a 24 hour news network would devote to covering a single issue, that that affects our mental cue. So the more time that the media spends on one issue or another, the more we believe that that issue is important, the more impact it has on our uh, policy decision making on our voting behavior. Um, so, like it, the, the, this could be newspaper headlines, it could be uh, magazine covers, it could be uh, CNN amount of time that they devote to one issue versus Fox News or whatever. Uh, that the way the media, the the volume, the density with which the media cover an issue will affect our rankings of importance of of those issues. So. The uh, or original um, paper that proposed agenda setting theory is a famous paper by McCombs and Shaw in 1972, where they, um, they surveyed the electorate in North Carolina, uh, asking them what issues were most important to them in the 1968 election. And those were the ones that people uh, listed. So we can do it ourselves. Like I do it in my classes all the time when I talk about agenda setting theory, that if you list, if you rank jot down in, in on paper or keep track in your brain of the, of the the issues that you believe to be the most important for our upcoming presidential election. Um, agenda setting theory says that those are going to be the issues that are covered most by the media. Um, so it, it's not that you have come to that conclusion yourself and then you seek out uh, media coverage to confirm or disconfirm your belief that your mental cue was given to you, was prescribed to you by the media. Um, so what they found in, what McCombs and Shaw found, what there, there was a direct correlation between um, the issues that citizens listed as important in the ranking and also the, the issues that were most covered in the media. Um, and this is repeatedly shown in, in um, in Pew Research Center reports where the amount of coverage the media, that issues in the media receive are directly correlative with um, issues that people think are important uh, in exit polling. Um, so the, the uh, agenda setting theory says that it's a unidirectional relationship, that it starts with the media um, and, and the media directly affect uh, the ways that we understand the world by organizing our rankings of important issues. Um, so if we think about this up, uh, upcoming presidential election, these are, um, as recently as last month, the issues that are listed as most important that people cite the most for the presidential election. These are going to be the issues that impact people's voting behavior the most, leading with the economy. Now, if you ask people four months ago, five months ago, they're not going to say the economy. They're going to say COVID. They're going to say coronavirus. But um, as time shifts, as people experience COVID fatigue, um, and they, they, the media stops covering it because people aren't, aren't watching, then it's, it becomes less of an important issue. So like the movement of these rankings is directly correlated with the, um, with the issues that people say are important or that are directly correlated with the, the amount of coverage they receive in the media. So um, agenda setting theory is well documented in traditional media like newspapers, like, like um, TV broadcasts, which um, old, the uh, boomer generation, uh, older generations prefer uh, over newspapers, over social media, but younger people value social media and there is, or go to social media more. They trust each other. They value each other's opinions more than they do uh, the reputations of, of different newspapers. So the question for agenda setting becomes not um, the correlation between the amount of coverage that issues receive and, and the issues that people think are important. That's well documented and, and it's assumed to be true. 
the question now for researchers in this area is uh, whether this carries over to social media, whether it carries over to new and in, in, uh, in digital and social forms of information dissemination. Um, and the answer is yes. So, and this is a, a as recently as this week, um, this one is from earlier this last month in, in September. This is a list of um, issues that got the most social media interactions uh, related to the presidential candidates and the issues. So uh, COVID is number one, followed by racial injustice. And th th these are mentions of these issues and social media interactions related to the presidential election. So you'll notice a, an uncanny the order is a little bit different, but an uncanny correlation between the amount of social media mentions of issues and the issues that are covered in the media. Um, and if you, Doug, interestingly, you can go to that Axios uh, website to follow in real time social media mentions of all of these issues. Uh, and you'll find that, that COVID uh, is, is precipitously dropping in terms of mentions, that it, would, it was at its, its highest in March um, in April, at the, at the whenever uncertainty was at its highest point, and now um, I can't see it because the it, there it is. So 62 um, million mentions of COVID, which is down from like 400 million mentions in March and April. So people aren't talking about it as much. Um, an agenda setting theory would predict that people aren't talking about it as much because the media is not talking about it as much. Um, and, and that's true, that, that especially with the presidential election, um, and, and it, it spiked with President Trump's COVID diagnosis. But uh, before that, especially, the media's coverage of COVID started to um, turn to different issues. Um, and it, it, there was a direct correlation with this Axios data with, with social media mentioned. So it appears preliminarily that agenda setting theory carries over to, to social media uh, mentions. And it remains to be seen whether uh, agenda setting theory can carry over to different modes of dissemination, but it, it looks uh, promising so far. But the important thing to remember with, with agenda setting, and you think of, about yourself, like what issues do you consider to be important and where do you get your news from uh, that, that in the majority of cases, um, in the absence of an electorate that is um, that is uh, like it, it takes agency in learning about the issues and reads every policy document on on the platforms of the Republican and Democratic Party, um, and stays neutral until they've learned all of the nuances of all of the issues. And I don't think anyone is going to is going to um, is going to mistake this electorate for, for, for that kind of electorate. So in the absence of that kind of electorate, we rely on the media um, in order to um, make policy decisions and to vote. Uh, so the, the, the media is, is, is kind of um, struggling through a difficult, existentially threatening historical moment, but um, it, at the same time, they're, they're directly impacting um, voting behavior and, and they know it, and they know it. Which brings us to, uh, and, and here, if we zoom in on those social media interactions of COVID, uh, they're way down. Um, so they peaked in, in late March, early April, around over 700 million. Um, and now they're way down to 62 million, uh, which is, troubling for public health professionals, um, for, uh, um, for people who are responsible for enforcing social distancing guidelines and mask wearing guidelines. But um, like it, 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 it's undeniable that people are experiencing COVID fatigue. Uh, and and the, the question for agenda setting theory is whether that COVID fatigue is uh, correlates with the lack of media coverage, and my, uh, my, I su suspect that it does. Now, which leads us to framing theory. Um, and framing takes agenda set setting theory a step further. Um, it says that the media don't only tell you what to think about. They don't only give you the cue of, of issues and in, in organize the cue, um, but they also tell you how to think about it. Um, that they give you a set of conceptual coordinates for understanding the issue, uh, that they isolate, they separate, they reify the issue and, and 
uh, give you the vocabulary, the phraseology with which to talk about the issue. Um, so without the media, then and unless you're doing your own independent reporting, um, and even in that case, you have to rely on the media who has direct direct access to the the the, the players. Um, that it, it 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 you you are completely dependent on the media for not only what to think about your mental cue. Uh, but also the frame around which the mental cue, uh, or, or the, the, the frame within which the mental the uh, issue rests. Um, so, in terms of the academic lineage of framing theory, it's a long one. Uh, it goes back to, to Goffman in the '70s, who uh, argued that we sense the world through frames. That without frames, we would go through the world like my one-year-old who is, tries to touch everything and, and taste everything and put everything in his mouth, uh, has no conceptual coordinates for understanding the world outside of what's immediately in front of him, uh, that without frames, we wouldn't be able to understand the world. So when, when we talk about frame and framing theory, it's not media bias, that it's not an intentional act on the part of the media to manipulate our views, um, but it, it, it is the necessity of the media to um, to gatekeep, to choose uh, parts of the issue to report and other parts of the issue to not report. Some parts of an issue to put on page seven and other parts of the issue to put on page one. So uh, we depend on the media to do that work. Um, so, and, and to take a very complex issue and um, make it palatable to us, make it absorbable, to make it understandable. Um, to, to provide us with the conceptual coordinates with, to, to understand the issue. Um, so it's not an intentional bias when we talk about framing theory, but it is the inevitable um, inevitable reification of an issue by the media, that the media gives us the language and, and the perspective and the lens through which to understand the issue. Um, and that Kahneman work, that, that, that famous work that I'm sure many of you have heard of, um, where he uh, said that people's decision-making behaviors depend on whether the issue is presented as a positive or a negative issue. Um, so for instance, if I walk into a grocery store um, and I want to buy hand sanitizer, then one hand sanitizer is presented as killing, destroying 99.9% .9 of germs, uh, and another hand sanitizer is, is presented as uh, only 0.1% of germs survive. Uh, that you're going to pick the 99.9% .9 one because it's a positive, it's a proactive uh, frame, whereas the other one is negative and passive. So you're you're more likely to, to make decisions based on the valence with which the issue is presented to you. Um, and 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 framing takes that that uh, that that theory and applies it to the media, and applies it to the media. So. Um, and again, it, it, the, all of these other areas, and I don't want to go through the whole academic lineage of, of, of framing, but uh, communication theory and communication studies is a relatively new field compared to more academically established fields. Um, so they rely on, on these other uh, fields and apply it to, to um, instances of communication. But I, I don't want to talk about the academic lineage. I want to talk about this guy. Um, some of you may recognize him. His name is Frank Luntz, um, that he is a Republican strategist, a Republican pollster, um, and really he, in part, is, is responsible for our modern understanding of framing um, in, in terms of the media. As it looks like an unassuming guy, normal-looking guy, but in 1997, um, he, was the, um, he, he was responsible, in large part, for the successful mayoral candidacy of Rudy Giuliani to the mayor of New York City, uh, that he was a really influential interpreter of, of polling data for the Republican Party. Um, and at the time in 1997, uh, the Republican Party was struggling to connect with voters, that um, Bill Clinton had just won his second term over the historically unappealing candidate Bob Dole, um, and, and the Speaker of the House was Newt Gingrich, another unpopular figure among voters. So the Republican Party was struggling to compete with uh, the very suave and smooth Bill Clinton to connect with voters. So what this guy did, Frank Luntz, um, was write this 200-page memo and, and distributed it to some uh, Republican lawmakers 
Um, and what it did was say that we're talking too much about the issues, that we're talking too much about the substance of the issues, that we have to frame the issues in ways that voters are going to understand. Uh, we have to frame the issues in ways that are going to uh, galvanize voters, that will inspire and motivate voters to vote in certain ways, that we're talking too much um, about the, the uh, esoteric details of policies uh, when we should be framing issues for an uninformed public. Um, and what he did was distill um, these 21 words for the 21st century. So you'll, 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 you hear these words all the time, like peace of mind, cutting edge, we're on the cutting edge of the issue, that we need to use common sense, we need to be reliable, we need to inspire respect, we need to have accountability to the voters, we need to have a comprehensive plan. So all of these are frames that the Republican Party could use, according to Frank Luntz, to uh, give voters coordinates within which to make their decisions. Um, so they're, they don't have, especially now, uh, where the millennial mind, the, the attention span of the millennial mind is shorter than that of a goldfish, eight seconds, um, that, that people aren't going to take the time to, uh, to, to learn in depth about the issues, that we have to frame them in ways that, that people can understand and that will motivate people to vote. Um, so Frank Luntz distributed this in, in 1997, and you see the remnants of these frames in, in political discourse today, especially the Trump campaign. Um, and he, he says over here that the key is to be um, to be more friendly, that we, we're not friendly enough, that we have to talk in sound bites um, that are shorter than the attention spans of our of our of our um, voting. Uh, of our electorate that we have to to attack, regardless of whether the attacks are uh, are are warranted, that we have to make attacks and we have to ca stop calling the speaker Newt by his first name because it shows a lack of respect. Uh, so we have to do these very simple things rather than talk about the substance of an issue. Uh, we have to frame the issue. It's about framing the issue. It's not about um, it, it's not about the 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 substance or the density of an issue. It's about the frame within which we talk about the issue. Um, so an important part um, of that of that memo that Frank Luntz wrote in, 90, in 1997 uh, is about climate change, and it, it has direct consequences for our understanding of COVID. He said on climate change in that memo in 1997 that should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue. Um, so what he was saying that way back in 1997 um, is that even though the science uh, will support one position or another, all we have to do is create dissonance in the minds of our voters. All we have to do is cast doubt on the veracity, on the reliability, the trustworthiness of the science, um, and people have enough dis dissonance that they're going to um, doubt the science. So, and you hear that today in discourse about COVID that um, there are debates about whether the science is reliable or not, that uh, the president wants to ca cast doubt on the, um, on the science of, of, um, of, of, of COVID um, treatments um, and, and to cast doubt on, on the trustworthiness of clinical trials and all. It's directly out of the Frank Luntz playbook of framing way back in 1997. So like if you look at this cartoon, um, Frank Luntz does not care whether there are any people on that no such thing bus or not. What he cares about is that there is a bus, um, that, that there is a such thing as there is no such thing as science. So that's what Frank Luntz cares about. Um, and that's what what the, the opposition party, whoever is not in power, will care about is casting doubt on the trustworthiness of whatever the, the party in power uh, relies on for their policy making. Um, and regarding uh, the, the, um, the the climate science issue, that back in 1997, um, the, the there was a, a newly minted PhD at Penn State uh, named Michael Mann who was. Um, he came up with this, uh, this wrote this paper uh, that became famous as the hockey stick diagram, and, and, it, and people in climate science know this, that, but it, it showed that uh, for the last millennium, uh, for the last thousand years, that uh, temperatures have remained steady and stagnant and linear, 
until the past 100 when they, there was a precipitous increase, when it shot up looking like a hockey stick. So it was stagnant for a long time and then it shot up. Um, and after that paper in 1997, that there was a concerted effort um, to discredit the science, to, um, to discredit him as a person, um, to, to uh, attack his character, uh, that there was a, a pseudo controversy called Climate Gate. Um, and when I was a, a grad student at Penn State, I interviewed him a, about this. And he later wrote a book uh, where he said uh, at one of the conservative, conservative political action conferences that um, there was a, a setup with his face where people were encouraged to throw eggs at his face. Um, so and, and the, the issue is not him. And the, the issue is not the data that the, the um, and they were, they were purporting to, to, to have found personal emails that showed that he had, that he had fudged the data. Um, so there's all of this raising of doubt about the veracity, about the, the, um, the trustworthiness of the science. And, and it's, 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 it's directly out of this Frank Luntz playbook of, uh, of framing. And, and back in 1996, Fox News was brand new that Frank Luntz is looking at this data and it's showing that um, people, even Democrats, that um, in, in, in jurisdictions where Democrats had access to Fox News when they were new in, in 96, were more likely to vote Republican, even if you're a Democrat. Um, and if you are a, De a Republican, you're more likely to, to, uh, to, to vote Republican, that you're more hardened in your views if you had access to Fox News. So. Um, in, in Texas, then Governor George W. Bush, that he was that um, his approval ratings were higher in, in districts that had access to Fox News. So um, Frank Luntz is seeing all of the, this data, and he's saying that it's about framing, that it's not about the the substance of an issue. Um, it's about the way the issue is presented. So, like for our purposes, that we're we're caught in the middle of of these uh, tidal waves of frames that are that are pushing us back and forth and having a tug of war on both arms to try to um to, to get to the top of our mental cue um and a lot of times especially if you're an uncritical uh, consumer of media um that we are helpless that we're helpless so that's why framing and agenda setting is extremely important important for the issue of COVID. and of course uh lakoff um responded with his own playbook for liberals called don't think of an elephant. So like on both sides, especially in an upcoming uh, presidential election, it, and it, it's, it's it, the media is, is existentially important and also under existential threat. So um, I tell my students all the time that there's no better time to be a communications major because um, the impact of communication has never been higher, even though um, reputationally uh, communication has never been lower. So in terms of framing, there are some famous examples that during the O.J. Simpson trial that, that Time Magazine was criticized for darkening the skin of O.J. Simpson, of, of changing the lighting, of making him look threatening um, and intimidating and guilty, uh, as opposed to a Newsweek cover where um, this is the original photo, which is it, 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 his, uh, he, he looks much less threatening, much more naive, much more um, much more innocent. So just the way that the, the, um, that the picture is framed will impact the way that we understand it. Um, and many of you will remember the, these covers that the one on the left was, um, there was a, a Korean airliner in 1983, I believe it was en route to, uh, or from New York City to Seoul and uh, mistakenly flew into restricted Soviet airspace and was shot down by a Soviet interceptor. And this is the cover of Newsweek, murder in the air with a bullseye with the, with the passenger plane in the center of it. Um, and then five years later in 1988, a very similar thing happened where the United States Navy um, shot down an Iranian passenger jet um, under very similar circumstances. And the Newsweek cover looked like this, why it happened, time to talk with Iran. Uh, so on the right, in terms of framing, they de-emphasize the agency of the United States and, and the, the shooting down of the plane. And on the left, um, it emphasized the agency of the, uh, of the Soviets in doing the same thing. So um, framing affects the way that people understand the issues. And we'll talk about how it works with, with COVID. But in terms of 
word choice that happens all the time that uh, the way the, the, the words with which the media talk about an issue undocumented worker versus illegal will will um, change the way will will um, change the interpretive lens and shape it and focus it um, on different parts of an issue versus another. So just by calling something pro-choice versus pro-abortion, and, and you hear this all the time in the Senate confirmation hearings, um, where uh, Democrats are trying to, to, to frame Amy Coney Barrett as, as, a, an, as an extremist, um, as, as, a, as a right-wing extremist, and they're using words that right-wing extremists would use. So um, in, in terms of a viewer that, that um, without critical consumption of the media, that we are playthings um, of the media's frames. Now, as I said before, that uh, often it's not an intentional, sometimes it's intentional, that we talk about the, the media consolidation and how um, that there are special interests at play in, in companies that own certain media outlets, but um, th that, that, is, th that topic's for another day. In terms of um, framing, that it's a natural inclination on the part of the media to frame issues, and it's our responsibility as critical consumers of the media to be aware of it especially with COVID. And then here's the last example that like in, in the Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman case, um, if I'm a newspaper and these might be the photos that I, I have available to me. So it, in, in that, that, um, that I have access to. And on the top, it, it, it makes George Zimmerman look guilty and, and Trayvon Martin look innocent and naive. On the bottom, it, it, may, it, it is the opposite uh, frame. So these frames, affect and position and orient us in relation to issues. Um, and they, they give us the vocabulary with which to argue, to debate. Um, so the, the, the debate that is the foundation of our democracy is really given to us, is prescribed to us by our media and the frames that they use to talk about the issues. So in terms of COVID, and I'll talk about um, how the, 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 what some recent content analyses have said about how the media globally have framed the issue of COVID. Um, and then I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the issue. But um, th this picture is from the New York Times uh, in May, May 24th, where they listed on the front page all of the victims of, or all of the, the, the people who have died um, from COVID-19. Um, and in that in, in in that case, the frame is 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 human interest. Is the loss of life due to the, to the coronavirus? And if I'm a newspaper, I can emphasize the uh, economic frame. I can the the the, um, the amount of restaurants that are going to go out of business, or I can talk about um, uh, racism or or ethnization with with blaming China or all, any of these different frames will affect. The way that we talk about the crisis. So, in terms of agenda setting, this is from um, a Boston University ongoing data collection project where they're, and you can go to their website and, and track in real time um, the the news topics related to uh, COVID nineteen. Um, and early on, uh, the the red bar, the, the COVID-19 outbreak in China, right around the time when we, when we were going home for spring break, um, that, that COVID, there was an outbreak in China, there was an outbreak in Iran, and that was what the media was talking about the most. Um, but now, as time has gone on, or, and, and it'll be different than this graph from March, uh, but it, the, the, the major, most covered um, news topic is the domestic outbreak. So, and it followed closely by government responses and actions. And I would um, guess that government responses and actions are number one news topic covered by, um, covered by the media. And I would also guess that that's the, um, the way that you would be talking about the issue. So think about your own conversations with your friends or your own social media conversations or um, your arguments with, with other people about COVID that, most likely the angle that you approach the issue with will correspond, if not directly, then very closely with the with this graph, with the with the um, with the amount of coverage that topics have received, uh, if agenda setting theory is right. So that was back in March. Here's May, where the economic consequences are the the primary 
um, topic of, of, of the media in regards to, to COVID-19. Um, so as the pandemic has gone on and as businesses have been suffering for, for longer and longer, and as the media has been suffering, the media is a business too. So they've been suffering a lot. So um, they might unconsciously or consciously frame the, the COVID as, as, a, as an economic disaster or whatever. They might spend more time talking about the economic consequences. Um, and then as a result, we tend to talk more about the economic consequences because we rely on the media to, uh, for information. So that is uh, agenda setting theory. In terms of framing, that there, there are a few comprehensive content analyses of the way the media has framed COVID. This is probably the, the most comprehensive. It, it's out of uh, Nigeria. And they looked at a bunch of different new, uh, media outlets, the BBC and Daily Mail, Le Monde um, in France, the Vatican, CNN, New York Times, uh, Punch, which is a Nigerian newspaper, People's Daily in China. Uh, and the frames that they identified were economy, so economic impacts and consequences of the pandemic, human interest, would, which would be about uh, people who are suffering, uh, the amount of deaths, that kind of thing, uh, conflict, morality and religion, who's responsible for it, politics, um, ethnic, 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 ethnicization, I can't say that word, um, but that would be about the, the origins of the virus or the, the agency of China in, um, in, in, in covering up the virus. And you'll notice that there's a lot of coverage in all of these global media about uh, the, with the fear or the, the, um, the scare frame, what they call the fear of the scare frame and a corresponding hope frame. Um, so fear or scare would be something that is threatening, something that that warns of a of a second wave, um, something that that warns that President Trump isn't taking it seriously, something like that that would cause fear, that would cause dissonance, and hope is the opposite. So uh, you'll notice that there is rel they're relatively they they mirror each other relatively closely, um, with the exception of the Vatican, which you would expect to be more hopeful, but. Uh, on average, there's much more fear mongering than there is hope mongering um, in the media. So if you combine all of those individual bars into one, you'll notice that human interest is the most common frame with which the media talk about the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Now, th this might have changed uh, over time. But right now, recently, this article is published in September of 2020 that the majority of, new, of news of media coverage across all different media um, is human interest. And uh, we'll look at some examples, followed closely by fear and scare, which should be uh, alarming uh, for us, uh, but also mirrored re relatively closely by hope. So what do those frames look like? And then I'll I'll go quickly through this, but like, for instance, for a human interest frame, it could be jobless claims. It could be a story about an individual who has died or lost family members, that kind of thing. Uh, the fear frame um, uh, that Britain might not be able to meet its ventilator capacity, that the, we, we might lose another 200,000 people by the end of the month, that this might happen, that that might happen, that college students aren't following the guidelines. All of that kind of stuff is a fear frame. Uh, because it approaches the issue, it frames the issue of COVID uh, around the that emotion of fear. So when we see it all the time, like if CNN has their running ticker since the very beginning, um, when they're they've had 208 deaths. Um, so since 208 deaths, now we're over 200,000. Uh, the the CNN has had a running ticker of of, of deaths and um in in the in the united states and that would follow it with, under that fear frame and a running ticker of people who have tested positive and people who have tested negative um and we have, like they, you understand that that um cnn is is has been uh sued multiple times by the trump administration um in in so whether or not you believe there's a conflict of interest is a, is a different is a different argument, but in terms of in terms of framing and the fear frame uh, that all of these things contribute. And if you look at the, the these local graphics with the with the uh, the red color and the threatening um, the the threatening uh, visual uh, that it creates fear. So the the, the media, in part, 
um, can contribute to feelings of uncertainty and feelings of um, of fear because of the way that they frame an issue. Now, the opposite would be the hope frame where they talk about optimism, they talk about uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, things like that. Where if you watch Fox News, it's very hopeful. So like the coronavirus is that zero. So they'll argue the opposite, um, the, the opposite perspective as CNN, which has a running ticker of all of the, the, the deaths, whereas Fox News had, will emphasize that there are zero deaths that were directly caused by COVID or whatever the, direct, the, the technicality is. So the way the media will frame, and they may frame it with a much more hopeful, a much more serene and tranquil, calming blue color, which is with a much less threatening graphic. Um, so all of the, those frames would affect the, not only the way you understand the issue, but the reality in which you live. That if, if your only source of news is CNN, or your only source of news is MSNBC, or your only source of news is, is Fox News, you literally live in a different reality than someone who, uh, who gets their news from an op opposite ideological perspective. And it goes back to that Kahneman work, that, that the options that we're presented with affect our decision making, and our decision making affects the way we see the world. Um, so this is the last thing that they, they conclude in that article that uh, there's no coherence to the framing. Um, in, in the their argument is that it it uh, it's because the media is obsessed with breaking news, and, and that's partly true. I think that uh, the media is trying to cover fill in its twenty four hour uh, news cycle uh, with news, and they're obsessed with being first rather than being right. At the expense of being right, they're obsessed with being being first, and there might be some truth to that. But I think the lack of coherence is due to the lack of truth, that we don't know, that that's why we're having this COVID lecture series. We're trying to figure out uh, what exactly it is that we are studying and how exactly the best way to approach it is. So there's no coherence, it, it, that there, there's a lack of truth. There's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uncertainty fueled by the media. So what do people have do? They go to Netflix. So if you look at this, um, this graph that People are, mo if you're not a part of the boomer generation, that most people, younger people will go to Netflix, um, are more likely to, to buy a Netflix subscription uh, now than they were before the outbreak because they are fatigued, that they're, they're, um, they're, they're tired of the uncertainty and the ambiguity and the media knows it and they're trying to find ways to reach a younger demographic and then the tautology continues. and. Um, and, and the, the uncertainty continues and, and uh, media consumers are the people who suffer. So that's where I want to stop and I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to um, field any questions or facilitate any conversation. Ron. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Delius. Um, and thank you everyone else for taking your time as well, like, like he mentioned. Uh, yeah, if anyone has a few questions, uh, we have a little bit of extra time. Uh, feel free to put them down in the comments in the, the little chat button and we can um, I can kind of go through those together with them. Um, also, uh, Dr. Delius, if you don't mind putting your email maybe down in the chat for everyone. Uh, if anyone has any further questions another time or, or just, you know, comments, wants to continue the conversation, uh, if he's, I'm sure he's willing to, to answer those at, a, at another time as well. And also, while we're, while we're waiting, I just want to remind everyone that we still have a few more uh, lectures on the schedule as of now. Uh, so please join us next week as well, next Tuesday. Uh, same time every single week, um, 1130 for, for your lunch break. Uh, and next week, we have Dr. Harold Menz. Uh, he is going to go over the, kind of the view of the pandemic uh, from around the world. Uh, so that's going to be super interesting. I think we're all excited to hear that one as well. Um, so please definitely join us uh, for that one as well. So um, if there are no questions, I don't see uh, in the chat yet. <clears throat> um, let's see, so thank you. So the email's there as well. Um, I'll put my email down there as well. If anyone has any questions, I am, uh, my name is Ron Thrash, by the way. I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement uh, Bethany. So if you have any questions for me as well, I'll put my email there. I can always put you in contact with anyone from the past lectures or now. Um, and as well as 
uh, anyone from the past or if you want to get a hold of any of the PowerPoints or anything. Um, and and, and uh, one of your uh, coworkers, uh, Rick Clancy, has a question. Rick, if you just want to unmute yourself, that's uh, completely fine. You can just go ahead and ask your question this way. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ron. I appreciate it. Hey, Dave. Uh, hey, Dave, in that chart that you showed um, regarding the, um, the media and how people rate different issues. There was one showing the economy as the number one issue and Corona as number uh, four, I believe. And then there was a follow-up chart of social media showing Corona is number one and the economy is number four. And I'm just wondering, do you think that reflects the prevalence of youth on social media? Why there's that differential? Yeah, I think so. Um... Is this the one you're talking about? Um, I know what you're talking about. So, the, like the I don't think so. But go ahead. Uh, I I think that younger people, um, it, it's well known that they don't use the same news sources as people who have grown up with newspapers. People have grown up with with broadcast news, and the the um, the, the issue is is about gatekeeping and the trust that we put on our journalists to gatekeep that when newspapers and uh, television were the only sources of news, there was no social media and there was no alternative sources of news um, that you had to rely on journalists for uh, to get your information that you did, that there was no other option. Um, so we entrusted journalists to do that job of gatekeeping for us. Um, but now with social media with alternative the sources of media with with um, with uh, any time access to, to news on smartphones that we don't have the same level of trust in journalists that we do um, when after uh, like Woodward and Bernstein when when enrollment in journalism schools went way up um, that they don't have the same kind of cachet and in part because young people don't give them the same kind of cachet because they have so many ways to circumvent. Uh, the 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 middlemen uh, the middlemen and women of journalists. So, I think that's true. Um, but it, on the other hand, that on social media, the same uh, the same logic applies in terms of gatekeeping. Except we don't look to journalists, and this was what my master's thesis was about. Like on social media, that we still look to gatekeepers to pick and choose the information that's important, and we trust their frames. Um, but we don't trust journalists, so we trust our friends. So we're much more likely to believe that an article is true if it's shared on Facebook by someone we trust in real life um, than if it is uh, if, if it originates from a reputable news source. So young people trust each other much more. They trust the bandwagon. They behave according to bandwagon heuristics much more than older people do. Um, so I think in part, yes, I think that that um, the, the changing news consumption patterns of younger people are responsible. Um, and, and some of it is, is uh, the, the trust that young people put in people to do their gatekeeping. That's a good question. Yeah, it may have been one of your earlier slides that showed uh, what people care about the most relative to upcoming election. Uh, the, and, uh, it struck me that uh, youth are, are less interested in the economy yeah, this is the one here, I think, where uh, top issues, economy was number one, but then when you look at social media interactions, it drops significantly to number four compared to the coronavirus. Yeah, but it, that, that's true. But when we're talking about the amount of people that we're talking about, like on, on that Axios diagram on the right, with the, the 62 million uh mentions, uh, like the, the amount of, of people, the order isn't really as important as the fact that they both appear on the same, within the same uh, the four uh, responses. So because yeah. there are so many people, like um, in, on, on the right, social media interactions, the, the, the one on the left, the, this was a, the results of a survey where people were asked uh, what issue is very important to you? And P so it was in the context of a, of a scientific survey, uh, whereas on the right, this is a content analysis of, of all of the different mentions of, of um, some word that, that is related 
um, topically to, to coronavirus in relation to, to the presidential candidacy. Um, and there are a lot of, of those kinds of tweets. So even though they don't correspond directly, the fact that they correspond at all within the same ballpark, I think is indicative of the, the, the power of agenda setting theory. I see, thank you. We have a few more questions. I don't know if you can see the, uh, the chat here, but I can go ahead and read a couple of them. I don't, um, I don't have it up. All right, speaking of human interest approach to covering coronavirus, have you noticed how Fox News uses human interest stories to cover coronavirus? And in general, is there any difference in the use of human interest approach in the media with different political leanings? That, that was one of the interesting things um, that human interest uh, frames uh, were used by all different types of media. So like obviously Fox News is a conservative leaning and, and uh, CNN, um, has gone all in on on the on the liberal leaning recently um, in terms of their editorial uh, approach, um, but it, like that is not an issue. Like then the the, the fact that uh, that our media are ideologically biased, I think, is not a a, a, a bad thing. That that like no one expects uh, that it, it it contradicts human nature to be objective and to be biased and to be robotic. Um, that the our our biases are what make us human. So for a new for, I, I, my uh, opinion is that it's not the ideological leaning of of the um, of the news source that's the problem. It is the the unthinking, unquestioning devotion to one ideologically biased news source or another that's the problem. Um, but in terms of human interest, I I. I have noticed that Fox News uses it, and they'll use it for a particular purpose. Uh, usually that's favorable to, to the president or, or to conservative causes, whereas um, CNN, MSNBC will do the opposite. Um, and they'll use human interest in order to, uh, in order to um, highlight the suffering of, of COVID uh, as a countermeasure to uh, the, the, the president's seeming um, downplaying of, of, the, of the pandemic. Um, so both of them will use human interest frames but they'll do it in different ways and they'll, they'll do it with with different purposes in mind so the carolyn kitchen's question about if the media is so polarized how do we know it's real and and i think that that's the whole point that we don't uh we, that there's no truth to be uncovered like it, it like when i was in journalism school we're told in the first day to be objective to be truthful to be accurate and unbiased but that assumes like that I'm going to cover a football game where something happened someone won the game that I know for sure that there's a truth that someone won and someone lost we're not on go trying to figure out who's winning and who's losing um, and, and who's being affected by the game but that's the case with COVID that we don't know for sure that we're learning more and we're learning what therapeutic treatments are more effective against COVID and what and and which ones are, are, are safe for public consumption and what we're learning as we go. So the media is reporting on something that isn't real, something that is a moving target. Uh, so like the credo of objectivity in journalism that is the whole identity of the, the journalism industry doesn't apply to something that is a moving target for which there is no truth. Um, so I, I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. And the, I think the, the response is to be critical consumers of media, to be media literate. Um, and there are a lot of uh, initiatives to, to make media literacy a mandatory part of, um, of, of uh, early educational curricula um, so that people grow up knowing about media consolidation and what companies own, what media outlets and what agendas, what media outlets have. Um, and, and how the media frame issues, because without it, we come to believe things that are real when they're not really real. And the person next to you might believe something completely different because they watch a different media outlet. And Victoria's question, I, I don't know. That, 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 there's, I, I know of some people who do that kind of work, so I can direct you to them, but I don't, I'm not exactly sure. That I, I know um, that the, the, the reputation of the legitimacy of, of um, American politics is uh, not the best internationally, and I'm sure Casey can speak more to that. But um, in, in terms of, of, of the media, like um, 
a, a lot of US media are international anyway. So um, the framing that would apply to uh, domestic media would also apply internationally, but that's a good question. I don't know. Um, in terms of the, the satiric uh, the news programs like Saturday Night Live, I think they, um, like Saturday Night Live is unabashedly left-leaning um, and they will uh, affect the way that we understand the issue. But I think that the, with framing, a lot of it is unknowing. So a lot of it is implicit, is below the surface. So we don't exactly, we aren't exactly aware of the ways in which the media is framing different issues. Whereas I don't think anyone who's watching Saturday Night Live is not aware that they're making fun of Mike Pence or they're making fun of Kamala Harris. That I think um, people are, are aware of that the frame within which they're talking about um, the issues is comedic, um, that like the, the weekend update is not a, a, a legitimate source of news. And I don't think anybody would, would say that it is, but um, like if you're watching CNN or Fox News or whatever, and you're trusting them to be objective and they make no claims to objectivity and can't because there is no truth, um, then that's the problem. All right, thank you again for answering all the questions. And, and I just wanna make one point to Victoria's questions. I'm not sure exactly about as far into the media, but I'm sure to find more information, especially from other countries and outside views. Um, I think Dr. Menz will do a good job at, at covering that next week. Um, so definitely Thank tune in for that. <clears throat> uh, all right, well, thanks everyone again for taking the time out of your day to join us. And, and thanks Dr. DeUlius for for taking your time to, to lead us in this discussion. Uh, we're looking forward to the, the many more that we have um, on the schedule and we'll continue these and continue the conversation overall. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah.